this is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Judith Ann. Okay, anybody that's going to make a short joke, do it now and get it over with. All right? God said. I may be short, but I'm from Boston. So. What? My name's Judith Ann, I'm an alcoholic. And I don't even know where to get going tonight here, really. First of all, I want to welcome the newcomers to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am a loyal member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the only thing in my life that has ever worked. Um, I am a little over 23 and a half years sober. And I tell you, if I can show up tonight fully dressed, with underwear on, I know where my car is, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works. I really want to welcome the newcomers. It is a delight for me to be in a room with so many newcomers. I want to welcome, uh, really, I know you hear speakers get up here and you think, oh my God. I used to think when somebody had two years of sobriety that it was a long time. But I tell you, if you do what's suggested of you, the program works. Congratulations to all of the CHIP people. Congratulations to the birthday people. And I hope that all of you will just keep coming back. Uh, as I said, my name's Judith Ann. I'm an alcoholic. I am a very good friend of Richard's, and I'm a very good friend of Neil's. We've known each other a very, very long time. And I was thinking that um, Richard and I used to work together a lot of years ago. And Richard actually found the program before I did. And if you go all the way down Washington Street and you hit the beach, that's where uh, 24 years ago you used to find me. And Richard came one day and he was really trying to carry the message. And I was there uh, smoking my smoking grass and I used to smoke so much grass that my porcelain nails were always on fire. And um, you know, my nails would be on fire and I'd be blowing them out and who cares. And, uh, and, I, and I'd sit there all day long and get a tan and I'd, you know, smoke pot and, I'd, and at the time I used to drink Heineken, and uh, one day Richard really interrupted my life, and he came and he told me that uh, he had joined the program and um, that there was another way to live. And I thought, well, I'll give it a whirl. And I gave it a whirl for about 10 days. I went, came right in one door and went right out the other. And you know, uh, for a person like me, that uh, finally got the program. It is truly a miracle. I um, am originally from Boston. I come from, yes. And I am a Boston Red Sox fan. Who cares? And I am a Celtic fan. Go Celtic! And, um, and I was, I was born into an upper-middle-class Jewish family. I had, yay for the Jews! <laughs> oh my God, I don't know why. You know, my sponsor always tells me when I go to speak to wear a dress, I could probably show up here with no clothes on tonight. Yeah. You know, and it wouldn't make any difference. So, I came from this really nice family. I had a great mother and father. I have a younger brother who was a surgeon at Cedar sinai and they always wanted the best for my brother and I. But I knew from a very, very early age that there was something very different 
about I never felt part of, I always had these fears, I do not like my size, I always wanted to be 5'10 and blonde, and I went through life with a chip on my shoulder, and I tell you, I think I came out of the womb that way. And um, I do not come from a family of um, alcoholics, I come from a family of gamblers and overeaters. <laughs> So they know every horse that's running, every track. Thank God for YouBet.com and TVG. And they're very occupied. And they also uh, are overeaters, so they know how to pull that chair up to the refrigerator. And um, they weren't alcoholics, but there was a lot of dysfunction in that house. And uh, I had my first drunk. My first drunk, I was 13 years old, and I was up at summer camp, and as I said, I had wonderful parents, and my parents always gave my brother and I every opportunity that we could, and uh, that's where I really discovered alcohol, was at summer camp. It was my first drunk, and I loved it. I ingested beverage alcohol into my system. I had bribed the custodian, Eugene, to go out my bunk, get my bunkmates and I a case of beer. And boy, I tell you, it was a glorious day, because when I ingested that beer into my system, I was everything that I wanted to be. I was funny, I was witting, I, I was charming. I was 5'10", I was blonde, and I knew that I had arrived. And you know, I took my first drink, I was 13 years old, and I got to the program, I was 43 years old. And I had 30 years of absolutely living like a lunatic, an absolute total lunatic. I mean, I was always in trouble, I could never find my car. I mean, it, the insidiousness of the disease of alcohol is, the insidiousness of the disease is, that it's not that's out so innocently with a, you know, with beer. And then, you know, then I used to drink seven and seven, and then I used to drink VO and ginger. And then uh, I can remember, uh, I used to have all these five different sets of friends. I had my Jewish friends, my black friends, my Protestant friends, my gay friends. And that's when I discovered scotch. And whatever group you were in, you know, whatever group you were in, you, that's whatever kind of scotch you were drinking. And, um, you know, uh, uh, my Jewish friends always drank Dewars, and my black friends, they drank JB and milk, and oh my God, and I just really, really, but my Protestant friends, they always drank that Johnny Walker Black, and I felt that if I ingested enough Johnny Walker Black into my system, you know, that I would wake up someday, and I would go, hello, how are you? Because, you know, all my Protestant, you know, I call. I call my Protestant friends from Boston, you know, they're like the binky and boopy crowd, you know. They got that long, straight hair. You know, Jewish women, we have the eye in our hair to get it straight. And they were always going, hello, how are you? And I'd be, well, goddamn, I never woke up saying hello, how are you? I always woke up, you know, where'd I hide my money? Who's this gorilla? How did I get here? You know, how am I gonna find my way home? And, and the longer that I'm sober, the more I realize why I never had a job. You can't work if you're always running up and down the streets looking for your car and trying to figure out, you know, what the hell happened the night before. So I was a scotch drinker for a lot of years. Now, the insidiousness of alcoholism is why would you drink something that you feel when you wake up in the morning that someone has hit you on the head with a friggin' hammer? I mean, why would you do that to yourself? And so I called up a friend of mine and I said to her, Barbara, I said, you know, this scotch is absolutely killing me. She said, well, you should try Tangeray Gin. That's gonna, that's gonna fix you right up. And you know, when, when I'm doing all these experiments, you know, I know this is a program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I have a great deal of respect for the program, but I have done every imaginable combination of drugs. You know, if I'm fat, I gotta take a pill that's gonna make me thin. If I can't sleep, I have to take a pill that's gonna help me sleep. And all the time, remember, I'm smoking pot, my porcelain nails are on fire. And, um, <laughs> And I am just a mess. Well, she forgot to tell me if you drink five stolen, if you drink five Tangeray martinis wherever you are, you disrobe. You take your clothes off. And when you're weighing 132 pounds, the bartenders are begging you to put your clothes back on and go home. 
<laughs> and so I drank for years, for years. And I wound up, you know, I wound up a confirmed vodka drinker. I loved that Stola Chania. And rigorous honesty is I knew exactly where the Kamchatka was on the, sh on the shelf. And I can tell you that I never, ever had any idea that every problem in my life was a direct result of my drinking. It was always them, they don't understand me. It was always, why does this happen to me? If I had more money, if I hadn't taken that flight, I have missed more flights in my life. I mean, and I never could figure it out. I could never get it that it is a direct result of my drinking. And of course, you know, I've got that disease also. I want, I need, I gotta have, why don't I have it? How am I gonna get it? I mean, I give myself a headache. So if I give myself a headache, imagine what I'm doing to the people around me. So. And I never really had a job. I mean, hooking and booking was my game, and I never, ever thought that I would ever, ever be self-supporting through my own contribution. I really like to be taken care of. The world out there, even today, with the amount of sobriety that I have, I find the world out there very, very difficult. I find the interactions with other human beings very, very difficult. I find, sir, my husband is always saying to me, well, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react. You know, what do they always say? I hope I get this right. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they always say, well, when a normal person has a flat tire, they call the automobile club. When an alcoholic has a flat tire, they call suicide prevention. <laughs> and, and, you know, no, oh my God, everything will happen to me. Oh, it's, oh, how? Oh. And, um, <laughs> and so that was it. And I've done a lot of geographics in my life, and I used to have this friend of mine, and he always used to tell me, you know, Judith Ann, if they're running you out of town, pretend that you're leading a parade. So I've led a lot of parades in my life. And I, ne I mean, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a thief. It never bothered me to go on vacation on your credit card. I actually preferred it that way. I mean, uh, you know, I was a great one with the checks. I remember one time before the computers were in, we stole all these cars from Hertz Rent-A-Car and we were selling them. I mean, uh, how I never went to jail. I mean, if I had spent as much time on my education as I had in concocting these scams, I mean, I would have done a lot better. And so, in, in leading parades, let's see, I've uh, left Boston, I've left New York, I've left Miami, I have been like the wandering Jew back and forth across this country, because if I'm one place, I should be another place, I should go here, I should go there. And always taking myself with me. So in the late 70s, I moved, I had an opportunity to go into this restaurant venture in Sausalito, California. And believe me, they wanted me out of town. I had, I mean, there was no one. I mean, talk about, even the lower companions did not want me. I mean, I drank in places that were so bad, it was easy to, it was easier to go to the bathroom in the alley than it was to use the ladies' room. And, um, and I never could figure out what was wrong with me. I knew that there was something wrong with me. I knew that I was an embarrassment to my family. I was an embarrassment to myself. And so I moved to Sausalito, California, and I went into this restaurant venture, and you know, I promised myself I am not going to drink. I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drug, I'm not going out with any good-looking guys, I'm going to devote myself to this restaurant, figuring that I'm going to be written up, you know, in the restaurant news, and as, as it turns out, I'm really lucky that I wasn't written up in the local police department. <laughs> And you know, Sausalito is a very, very small community. And did I didn't know my partners were selling coke out of the restaurant. And you know, once I got here and I vowed, I vowed that that's one thing that I would never do. But then when you're here and you're in the middle of it, you know what, it's not so bad. I mean, we were so stupid in that restaurant. We used to steal from ourselves. That's how stupid we were. I mean, we used to invite 17 of our nearest and dearest friends over for dinner and everybody's drinking champagne and they're eating and we're signing the check, signing the check. My girlfriend's having an affair 
Could she have an affair with a, a champagne salesman? No, the guy was, what is that crap? Green creme de menthe. We had cases and cases of green creme de menthe. If you gave it away, no one's going to drink that crap. And Richard, you know, Richard really likes this story. I don't know how funny it is now, but, you know, we were robbed so many times. We had this alarm system, and if you didn't call the police in, you know, we'd have to call the police. We're leaving and put the alarm on. And so one night, you know, we're there, and we're Partying and it, it and I have no clothes on and I'm sitting at the you know I'm sitting at the bar <laughs> and um, you know this is really a way to run an establishment and um, and you know the police are knocking on the door boom 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 and um, I, I'll never forget this guy John Urias and he goes and lets them in and they go you know well who's the manager here and I leap off the bar stool no clothes on I the manager. And, you know, with 132 pounds, they're going, holy shit, you know, we see why this place isn't doing any business. And, you know, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, some of my stories. And so what happened was, um, believe it or not, we lost the restaurant. Uh, I know you find that hard to believe. And uh, so I moved to Los Angeles. And, um, you know, once again, I, and I would get these brilliant ideas. You know, I never, every place I have ever moved, I never did it like a normal person. You get a place to live, you get a job, you save some money. Never did it like that. I'm just going. And uh, so when I came to Los Angeles, I had really wanted to do commercials. Never took an acting lesson in my life, never knew an agent, no one. So I moved to LA and I knew two people. I knew a girl, and her husband was friendly with one of my husbands. And um, my brother, and I told you, my brother is a surgeon at Cedar sinai The guy's got more degrees than a rectal thermometer, and he does not hang out at the dude drop in. And so, with all these goals, but oh, you know, I want to do commercials, I want to do commercials. So where do we go? We go where we're most comfortable. Where are we most comfortable? But to me, I was a great barroom drinker. So I was in this bar, you know, having a few cocktails. Oh, and I always played these songs over and over and over and over. And I would play, you know, really happy songs like Billie Holiday, The Man That Got Away, you know, The Man, that, the man That's Trying to Get Away. And, um, <clears throat> And I remember, oh my God, I was so in love with this guy. This guy's name was Joe Perry. And I'm telling my age with these songs, but Gloria Lynn used to sing this song, Happiness is Just a Thing Called Joe. And God forbid I went in a bar room and that song was on there and I would play it over and over and over. You know, and I'm getting drunker and I'm looking in the mirror and my lipstick's under my nose and I'm thinking, I don't look too bad tonight. You know, I really am something. And I used to have this long blonde hair, God only knows, I mean, and I was always one of these that was throwing my hair back. And uh, so anyway, uh, while I was having a few cocktails, and I always told everyone my tail of woe, even if they didn't want to hear it, I told them my tail of woe. So I met a guy by the name of Big Ed, and Big Ed was a bookmaker. And uh, I don't know any of you are familiar with bookmakers, but you know they hire people as agents, and you run around, you get all these other people to, to gamble, and uh, you know you get a percentage of what they lose, and you get a nice percentage because not often do they win. So anyhow, he tells me, well, you have to go to this place in Beverly Hills, and you have to get a job as a hostess because there's the right kind of people that go in there. So off I went, you know, and God, these people had to be desperate for help because they hired me. And actually, that's where I met Richard. And I think the first words out of my mouth to Richard were, you know, I heard you get some pretty good coke. That was my introduction to Richard leaving. And, um, you know, I worked there. I worked there. And, uh, don't ask me, I could only work four days a week. I could never find my car. I had fuzzballs all over my clothes. I mean, I'm shuffling the people around, and I'm drinking wine. And if you came in and you had a little toot, I'd run out back and do a little toot. And then I'm smoking grass. The nails are on fire. God only knows where I am. And this went on, believe it or not, for four years. 
And then I told you in the beginning when I started speaking, you know, Richard came down to the beach and Richard tried his best to carry the message. But I knew better. And I went off and I, I had, um, uh, while I was shuffling the people around, uh, this guy came in and that light bulb goes off that the, alcohol, ho the alcoholic woman knows and says, there he is. There is true love. I'm going to be rescued. And, uh, you know, he was Jewish, I was Jewish. In fact, he was a drug dealer, and I'm kind of a hooker booker there. It never, <laughs> never dawned on me that it wasn't going to work. And I got married July 4th, 1984. And I got to the program January 1st, 1985. And it was the six months in my life that I never, ever imagined. I mean, believe me, I had been in situations before. I've never been to jail. I mean, half the time I was on the sidewalk driving. It's only through the grace of God. But this six months was the absolute worst. I mean, he, uh, I mean, we had this house over at 4th and Fairfax. There were broken windows. There was no furniture in the house. There were no locks on the door. And um, I just stayed high. I was on this six months that was unbelievable. And during that period, that six month period, I went off on this six day bender that was unbelievable. I could not get drunk and I could not get sober. And I wound up in a closet. And I wound up so paranoid. And when I finally, finally came out of that closet, you know, and I always had these great remedies. I was always so smart. And that time, my remedy for a hangover was Nestle's Quick and a bag of pretzels. And, you know, every alcoholic woman has this negligee, and mine was green. And it had all these cigarette holes in them and Nestle's Quick stains. And, you know, I was not a vision for you. And, uh, and, and during that period, you know, um, Richard and I have another friend who has never joined us in the program, but she came over to my house and she did a lot of business with my husband and she took one look at me and she told me, she said, you are really in trouble. And I couldn't believe that this woman was telling me that I was in trouble. And it was the very, very, very first time in my life that I actually heard something. I heard it. And I picked up the phone and I called my brother and I told my brother, I said, you know, I said, I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. And it was the first time in my life that I ever admitted that. And my brother said to me, well, I, I really don't know where to send you. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, he's a surgeon. He doesn't know where to send me. And I got on the phone that day, and I kept calling and calling and calling and calling. And you know, it's like the gerbil syndrome. One person sends you to another person to another person. Because my husband and I did not have any insurance, and no one wanted me. And what happened was I wound up at Thalian's at Cedar sinai And that's where my life really, really began. That's where my story begins. And um, uh, they told me to come over. And I'm not telling you that I went over sober. And I'm certainly not telling you that I went over there without my attitude. But I did show up. And, and that day, I never, ever smoked that stuff again. Because I knew that I had gone over that invisible line. And um, what, what they told me was that I was going to be evaluated. And they explained to me that I was going to go to six one-hour sessions. And at the end of these sessions, they were going to tell me what was wrong with me. Never made it to six sessions. At the end of the fourth session, they called me up and they told me to come over. Now, you know, when you are new in sobriety, you really don't hear what we're saying. I mean, you hear blah, 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 sponsor. Blah, 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 big book. Blah, 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 something about 90 meetings in 90 days. Blah, 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 get a commitment. And that's all you really hear. And so these doctors are talking to me, and they're telling me what's wrong with me. And all I'm hearing is this blah, 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 blah. But this is what I heard. They told me that I was alcoholic. And they told me that if I was ever going to do anything constructive with the rest of my life, that it was necessary for me to become abstinent. I didn't have a clue what abstinent was. I thought it was a horse in the third race at Hollywood Park. <laughs> How does a human being get to be 43 years old and not do one constructive thing with their life? 
and they told me that I was very sick and they had wanted me to go into detox. And you talk about the pitifully incomprehensible demoralization that the alcoholic woman feels. How is this possible that I should go into detox and my brother's running around in these green scrubs, I want to operate, I want to operate. And you know, um, I gave one of my great Gone with the Wind scenes, you know, tipped over the chair, I'm out of here. And, um, you know, I was not going to go into detox, but I tell you that I made the commitment to sobriety January 1st, 1985. And it was people like Richard and Neil that came along and took me to meetings. And it was people like Richard and Neil that really, really tried to help me. But, you know, I had one slip. I had one slip. And that one slip, after really hanging on there for 27 days, I mean, that one slip is what did it, because when I went out to get whacked, I saw my life, and it was like a friggin' horror show. I saw the people that I had hurt, I saw what I had become, I saw the embarrassment and shame that I brought to my family, I saw how anything good, even now, with the amount of sobriety that I have, any opportunity, anything good that comes into my life, once I ingest beverage alcohol into my system, it is over. I am one of these people in the program. Am I done? I am one of these people in the program that I truly believe that one is too many and a hundred isn't enough. And I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous January 28, 1985, and I have been here ever since. And I just want to say a few words about my sponsor because I was fortunate enough to be sponsored in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor came out of the Crenshaw Rolano Club. He's long gone. He's at the big meeting in the sky. But my sponsor was part of, his name was Manuel Stewart. And he was part of this group that was Manuel Stewart, and there was Wardell, and there was Merlene, and there was Helen Louise. Helen Louise just passed away last year. And my sponsor was a vision for you. He could walk into a room at any time. And he, this is what he shared with me about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He told me to sit up front. He told me to take the cotton out of my ears and to put it in my mouth. He taught me to shake the hand of other people and say, how are you today? Because if I'm asking how you are today, I am not thinking about my favorite subject that is me. <laughs> he told me to go to a big book study and go to a step study. He told me to stay out of the politics of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I will be welcome in any room at any time. I mean, he also told me lack of profanity offends no one, but I, I let that go right over my head. <laughs> And this man is the one that if he could see me today, he was the one that told me that I had to go back to school because I was equipped to do nothing. He was the one that made me take that job at DuPaz. I used to work at DuPaz. What do you call me, Neil? Pancake, pancake Judy. And I used to serve those friggin' pancakes every morning. And if people didn't like their breakfast and they'd say, oh, you put butter on my pancakes, and I'd start crying. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm trying to get sober, you know. <laughs> And you know what? You know, then say, lady, that's nice you're trying to straighten out your life. We just want to eat our breakfast and get the hell out of here. And I know that my time is almost up, but there has been so much that has happened to me in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And anyone here, if I say anything at all, I just hope that I gave you a little ray of hope. I mean, I actually have a job today. I, I mean, I work for one of the most corporate, conservative companies in the United States, and I show up every day with my underwear on. <laughs> And I can tell you that for those of you in the program that have less time than I do, I will pray for you that you'll stick around and give this way of life a, a chance. And for those of you in this program that have more time than I do, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yo.